on February 2nd in 1945, I was eight, became 18 years old. I was a senior in high school. A week or so later, uh, then you, because I was 18 and that I had to register for the draft, that was the law. And maybe two weeks or so later, I was on a bus to Newark for an army, for a physical. Now at that time, supposedly, they allowed you to choose the service you wanted to be in. And so I chose the Navy and they stamped Army down on the, <laughs> on the, on the paper. Initially, all of the training for, was for the invasion of Japan. And remember, at 18 years old, you're indestructible. We never thought about dying at that until the day, uh, until a week after basic training, they gave me this rifle. And then we realized that this was not going to be, this was not fun. However, in August, the atomic bomb was dropped. Japan surrendered. So that was the end of... Um, the um, training for the invasion of the... So we just went through the regular training and nobody thought too much about it. After the... It was a 17-week basic training period. After that, uh, they sent you home for a week and then I had a report back to Camp Blackstone, Virginia. So we boarded the ship in New, uh, New York and left for uh, Naples, Italy. When I got to Naples, Italy, they put us on a bus or trucks, really. So we were there for a couple of days getting orientation, what have you, boarded a train and headed for Livorno, Italy. And so I was assigned to the 177th Military Police Company, which was um, the port police. So then... After a while, I have no idea why they decided that they needed us in Naples. Things. One one of the interesting things was uh, we were on the walking patrol, and this Italian gentleman comes up and he said, "There's a German POW in that house." Well, they really weren't supposed to be there, but anyway, we uh, so we go in. But before we went into the house, we walked around the back, and there was a ladder set up. This he was supposedly, supposedly on the first floor, <laughs> and we walked in. And now I thought I was in an Italian movie, because there was a Italian lady came to the door in her slip. I thought she was Anna Mangani, the <laughs> Italian movie star, and we asked where the German soldier was. No, there isn't any here. So we pushed by her, and there in, in the bed, sitting up, was this magnificent-looking German soldier, about over six feet tall, blonde hair, a tan, because they were, they worked, uh, they were in a prison camp, but they, but by this time, they were getting them out of Italy and sending them back. They could, they freed them and send them back to Germany. So... They were out where he had, and he was, uh, well, stripped to the waist, magnificent. We we got him out, and she came with us, and uh, for some reason or other, I don't know whether somebody called him or not, our jeep <clears throat> came up to take him back to camp, I guess. In the meantime, all of the Italian neighbors came out and started spitting at the girl. So there was still this reminiscence of the German occupation of of uh, that of, of Italy and it wasn't very really wasn't very pleasant. Oh Mike the monkey. Somebody I don't know where he came from. Somebody brought him over from Africa. I think we had a little rhesus monkey Mike. And so uh, he would get loose every once in a while and write havoc. When we went to Naples, we took him with us, and we were in a long one-story building like a barracks, and Mike was with us, 
sometimes somebody would give Mike beer <laughs> and he would get drunk and he'd get loose and he'd go into the barracks and upset everything. <laughs> and we'd have to come back and make the, make the, I don't know really, I guess he stayed in Naples when we were all sent to the 88th Division. I don't know what happened to him. But he was a mascot and was not a very clean creature. After a while, in the Naples area, all of a sudden they decided to uh, send us to the northern Italy. It seems that Marshal Tito, the dictator of Yugoslavia, didn't like the borderline between Italy and Yugoslavia. They were sending U.S. troops home. Those combat troops were sent home. So the division was depleted. So they sent, grabbed anybody they could get down in what was called the peninsula base sector and sent them up to the 88th Division on the Yugoslav border, very close to the Austrian border. So when I got there, I thought, oh, gee, am I going to end my army career living in a tent out in the woods someplace? They needed a, a photographer. And I had taken photography in high school. So I made believe I was an expert <laughs> and was assigned to what was called the information and education section of the 350th Infantry Regiment. All of the photography work was mainly public relations. So, uh, but then towards the end of my Army career, they had a... Um, Eisenhower came for a visit, and they had a huge division review, and uh, he was there, and you know, it was a grand affair, and uh, he, they were playing the Star Spangled Banner, and the rule is that you stand at attention and salute, which I did. Now, Eisenhower was about four feet from me at that point. After the Star Spangled Banner, I see he starts to walk over towards me. And I said, hmm, I wonder what, I mean, I'm a private. He's a five-star general. He said, I want to commend you for standing at attention during the Star Spangled Banner. Most photographers would be taking my picture. If you want, I'll pose for you. <laughs> So I took his picture, and, and, and but the best picture was as he was leaving, he got in this huge four-door Mercedes convertible that German generals would ride in, and I was about two feet from him, and he gave me this big smile. So I have a picture of him leaving with a tremendous smile. Sometime in December, they sent us, I was ready to go home. Back, I was back in Livorno in the port where I began boarding the ship and we left and I got home sometime in January. And that was the end of my military career.